Turn with me, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel is the only book of the scriptures, of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, that contains all three original languages. It contains Hebrew, it contains Greek, and it contains Aramaic. It actually has Greek terms for things like psaltery, symphonies, musical instruments. But essentially, from chapter 2 through chapter 7, is Aramaic. This is the way Daniel works. In the beginning, the introductory chapters are Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7, Aramaic, and then 7 to the end of the book, reverts back to Hebrew. The sections of Daniel in the beginning that are primarily for Israel and the Jews are in Hebrew. They're in Hebrew. The sections that are for the Jews in relationship to the Gentile nations are in Aramaic. That was the lingua franca of the time. What Greek was to the New Testament, the lingua franca, so Aramaic was to the time of Daniel. The closing chapters, when it reverts back to Hebrew, are things that are both for Israel, but also for the church. However, there are multiple recurring themes in the book of Daniel. One of which is the Antichrist, and also this idea of the image, the statue that keeps coming back. This will come back again, as what we know as the Shikuts HaMeshomem in Aramaic, the abomination of desolation. Let's begin to understand this from Daniel chapter 3. Remember, this happens again. The first and foremost key after prayer, the first and foremost key to understanding the future is to understand the past. If we don't understand history, particularly biblical history, we will never understand prophecy. The key to understanding Prophecy is understanding history. If we don't know what did happen, we're not going to understand what is going to happen. We call these things Pesher interpretations. Verse 1, Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. What you have here in the original text is this. In Aramaic... It's similar to Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word for six is shesh. Echad, shtaim, shalosh, arba, hamesh, shesh. The word for sixty is literally sixes. Sheshim, sheshim. Shesh, sheshim. Aramaic, it would be shetim. Shetim, almost the same as Hebrew, Aramaic and similar, very Hebrew. Shetim. What you have here in the original language is something whose dimensions work out to 666 six, six in the original text. It does not come across in the original language, but it works out to 666. Six, six. Before people begin looking for the name of Henry Kissinger and Roman numerals or some other thing like that, we should look wherever that number appears in Scripture. And that number appears many places in Scripture. You're never going to begin to understand Revelation 13. We just won't get it until we understand the other places, all of the other places, that that number occurs in Scripture. Sometimes it occurs literally and straightforward, as when Solomon backslides. Other times it is concealed in the typology numerically in the original languages, but it is there recurrently, and of course it's dealt with in the book Shadows of the Beast. But let's look. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now let's understand, first of all, the Babylonian Empire was not the precedent. The precedent was the Tower of Babel. But the Old Testament, the Old Testament apex, 
That is the Old Testament type of Babylon the Great was the Babylonian Empire. The way that the tribe of Judah and Benjamin went into the Babylonian captivity is a picture of what is going to happen both to Israel and to the church in the last days. There is another Babylonian captivity coming. And we see this already. More and more Christians through things like the ecumenical movement, the emergent church, Rick Warren's global peace plan. What does he teach? Rick Warren, supported by people like Mark Driscoll and supported by people like John Piper, is openly teaching people that we have to partner with other religions in order to establish global peace. Now the scripture tells us no Christ, no peace. It's only the Prince of Peace that we can have peace. We are warned by Paul. When men say peace and safety, then the end will come. We are specifically warned about people who have a Christless peace plan. Christless peace plan. But it's openly on his website. It's openly what he teaches. He has a global peace plan. We have to partner with people of faith. It doesn't matter which faith. It doesn't matter which God. Now Moses said other gods are demons. He said this openly. Shadim. Moses called other gods Shadim, demons. Paul said other gods are demons. Demonoi in Greek. Are Krishna is a demon. Allah, the Nabataean, the Nabataean moon god, is a demon. Rama, Sitra, these things are demons. Well, according to Rick Warren, supported again by those who back him, like, uh, unfortunately, others like Greg Laurie, unfortunately, people like Mark Driscoll, unfortunately, people like John Piper, they're supporting this man with this agenda he has, a global peace plan. We have to unite with people of other religions who worship other gods. We have to unite with demon worshipers to bring in global peace. Now, when you see people saying we have to have a confederation of the world's false religions, united in a political agenda, that is antichrist. Remember, as we speak, as of this very moment, the same as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of antichrist is preparing the harlot church for the coming of the antichrist. I'll say it again. The way that the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the harlot church for the coming of Antichrist. That's what is on back of the ecumenical movement. That is what is on back of the emergent church. That is what is on back of Mr. Warren's global peace plan. We have to unite with people of faith. It doesn't matter, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, people of faith to bring in worldwide peace. This is the Antichrist agenda. It is controlled by the Antichrist spirit. It is demonic. It comes from the pit of hell. No Christian in their right mind should subscribe to the purpose-driven lie. Anybody who's endorsing that deception is already being deceived themselves. The Antichrist is having the way prepared for him by the spirit of Antichrist. The same as the Holy Spirit is preparing the true bride for the coming of Christ. You cannot say, well, we just agree with him on certain things. No, no. I am the Lord your God. You will have no other gods before me. There is no other place for any other God. When I see people who should know better subscribing to this purpose-driven agenda, even some of people that I never would have dreamed would have done it, People who grew up under the teaching of Pastor Chuck Smith. People who were taught better and who know better. Simply doing it to pursue numbers and power and whatever else their agenda is. It's not God's agenda. It's not God's agenda. Jesus never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. We cannot be united with people who worship other gods. We cannot be united spiritually with people who worship demons. Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. In pursuit of a political agenda, we unite with the demonic. This is an outrage. But it's something specifically the New Testament warns us of, and so does the prophet Daniel. But let's continue. By the way, I will debate you, Mark Driscoll. I will debate you. I will debate you quite happily, John Piper. I will debate you quite happily, Rick Warren. I'll debate any of you people on this issue alone, publicly, in front of a camera. Anytime you want, let me know. I'll be there in front of a camera. As long as it's put on the internet, I'll be there. 
I will prove you are deceived and that you are being used by Satan to deceive others. You are working for the Antichrist. That's what you are doing. But let us look. Then the herald loudly proclaimed in verse 4, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Notice here, you have Greek words in the original text. It goes from Aramaic to Greek. It is something encompassing all nations and all peoples, just like the Antichrist. This idea of being worshipped by music in a demonic sense is exactly what Isaiah chapter 14 says is true of Satan as the king of Babylon. Exactly what you see in Isaiah 14 of Satan. Just as Jesus was God who came in a human form, that's what the Antichrist will be. Now whenever you see a picture of a united world with one religion in scripture, like the Babylonian Empire, something that was politically and economically united with one religion, a pantheon, that is a picture of the kingdom of Antichrist. The same thing is recapitulated with the Roman Empire. The exact same thing. The original title of the emperor as head of the pantheon of Rome was Pontificus Maximus. He was the pontiff. He doesn't care, didn't care what religion you had. Every religion was okay as long as you acknowledged him as the pontiff. Sound familiar? Let's understand something. Imagine a world where Iran is becoming a serious threat to the Western world. Where Greece is in crisis, where Rome is unstable and it's affecting the foundations of Europe. Iran emerges as a military and strategic threat to the Western world, where Greece is in utter crisis, and Rome, Rome is in a precarious state that is bringing instability to Europe. The year. 430 B.C. If you want to know what's going to happen, begin by looking at what did happen. Prophecy is pattern. The key to understanding prophecy is, first of all, prayer, but then history. If you don't understand history, you won't understand prophecy. Let's continue. So you have a one-world empire with a united economy and a confederated religion, Babylon, under a man having himself deified. Bowing down, genuflecting to a graven image. The Greek word prosciutto, the Hebrew hishtak bayah. Not to offend Roman Catholic people or Greek Orthodox people, but when you see people venerating a graven image. I'm not talking about religious art here. I'm talking about the veneration of an icon or a statue. It is the word for worship in the original languages. It is idolatry. I don't care how sincere that lady is with the rosary beads bowing down to a statue of Mary. She's praying to the dead. It's the sin of necromancy. When you see people genuflecting before a crucifix, it is idolatry. It is not biblical Christianity. People will say, you don't love Catholics. I love Catholics very much. Half my family is Catholics. Because I love Catholics, I want them to know the truth. How many ex-Catholics we have here today? Put your hand up. Am I telling the truth, ex-Catholics? Yes. yes! And I love Jewish people. I want them to know the truth. You're being set up for a false messiah because you've rejected the true one. I love Jews and I love Catholics. But because I love them, I want them to know the truth. Jesus never compromised truth in the name of love. On the contrary, because he loved, he told the truth. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, that your love, agape, may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. When you see people compromising the truth in the name of love, it is not the love of Jesus. It is a stupid, emotionally charged religious counterfeit. It is babbling foolishness. They imagine to be love. It's based on emotion, but it's not based on the love of Christ. As soon as the woman at the well began with her false doctrine, where is sin atoned for? You 
Jews have that mountain, we have this mountain. Before he went any further in the conversation, the Lord Jesus corrected her wrong doctrine. Lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation comes from the Jews. Now, he was very open with her, very loving. He divulged to her things about himself. He didn't tell even his own apostles up to that point. But when she began with her false doctrine, he didn't say, well, at least you believe the Torah and Moses and the Messiah's coming. Now you believe in me. That's okay. I don't care how you believe sin was atoned for. No, no. He told her the truth. The woman who was in Syrophoenicia with the demonized daughter. Jesus made what would in modern terms certainly appear to be a politically incorrect, if not racist, statement. I cannot give the children's bread to dogs. In Greek, it's actually diminutive, puppies. Please help my little girl. She's demon-possessed. I can't give the children's bread to dogs. It would sound like a racist statement. I assure you, Jesus loved that little Syrophoenician girl as much as he loved any Jewish little girl. But first he confronted her mother with the facts. Your religion is unfit for human consumption. There's only one God. There's only one way to God and only one salvation. Mormonism is not fit for human consumption. Talmudic Judaism is not the Judaism of Moses and the prophets. Jehovah's Witness beliefs are not fit for human consumption. Roman Catholicism is not fit for human consumption. Islam is not fit for human consumption. It's not for human beings made in the image and likeness of God. False religion is for dogs, not for humans. That's what Jesus told her. You're a human, eat like one. He always dealt with the false doctrine before he told the truth. He told the truth in love, but he pulled no punches. That's what Daniel's warning us about today. You can either be politically correct, which means you are theologically incorrect. You can be led by the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, or you can led by, be led by the spirit of Jesus. You can subscribe to the spirit of error or follow the spirit of truth. You're either being prepared by the Holy Spirit for the coming of Christ or you're being seduced into waiting for the Antichrist. That's exactly what they are doing. It's unbelievable what's happened to the church in the last 25 to 35 years. The things people are believing. People who know better. At least they should. But let's continue. So it goes on. Verse 6, whoever will not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You yourself, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews, notice certain. And there are certain Chaldeans, notice certain. Not all non-believers are going to have an agenda to persecute believers. But not all believers are going to stand firm in their faith. Many will compromise. There'll be certain believers as there were certain Jews. Expect the mainstream denominations to sell out because they've sold out already. Let's continue. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
the Chaldee names of these Jewish boys, then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image I've set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, and the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I've made very well. But if you'll not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you from my hands? Now understand how this works. Notice he tries to appeal to them, be reasonable. Understand what the abomination of desolations will be. The shikuts ha-meshomem. Shikuts ha-meshomem. In Hebrew, meshomem is the modern Hebrew term for boring. But it's an, actually an Aramaic term, meaning desolation, desolate. Ha-shikuts ha-meshomem. The shikuts that makes desolate. What is a shikuts? The term comes from the term sheketzim. It's found many places throughout the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. It's from this term we get the derogatory Yiddish term for a Gentile woman, shiksa. It means a slimy reptile. We usually mistranslate it in English as something like your detestable things. The serpent beguiled the woman, remember? Eve is a figure of Israel and by incorporation the church. The nature of women is they're much more sensitive than men. It's easier for women to get saved than men usually, but they're also much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. The serpent beguiles the woman. As I pointed out many times in the book of Revelation, the dragon and serpent are cast down to you. The dragon is Satan the persecutor, the serpent is the seducer. So it's going to use spiritual seduction to make desolate. This term, Sheketz, Sheketzim, found throughout the Old Testament, is normally applied to Baal worship. Baal worship. If you don't know, Baal is also the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. The Hebrew prophets said, your husband is your maker. Yahweh is to be the Baal of Israel. The same as Yeshua, Jesus is the bridegroom of the church, the bride. That is why the Hebrew prophets like Jeremiah, Amos, Hosea, and the Apostle James in the New Testament, and I apologize to those who are aware of this, use the term adultery to explain idolatry. Idolatry equals spiritual adultery. When Israel went after other gods, it was something like, daughter of Zion, you played the harlot, wrote the prophets. When the Apostle James, who was writing to Jewish believers, it's the oldest book of the New Testament, the first one written, wrote in chapter 4 of James about worldly churches, you adulteresses, it would have smacked them right over the head. It would have said you're as guilty as the sin of your forefathers going after other gods, worldly churches. Adultery, idolatry, spiritual adultery equals idolatry, idolatry is spiritual adultery. Satan wants to take God's woman, and he's going to do it by spiritual seduction. That is how the Shikuts HaMeshomem works. We'll look at this again tomorrow, when we get to chapter 9. He's going to use spiritual seduction to take God's woman. He's going to take Israel and set up the image in the temple, but he wants to get the church. It won't take much effort. He's already got the World Council of Churches in his pocket. Tear Fund New Zealand is directed by a man who's promoting same-sex marriage and it claims to be the Evangelical Alliance for Relief. Some guy's telestrop in New Zealand, pro-homosexual marriage. It's getting worse by the day. The seduction is getting in all the time. Not just among the liberal churches. 
But let's go further with this. How was he going to do it? This abomination prefigured by this image. How was it going to happen with the 666? How? He wants God's woman. Baal, you have the Canaanite Baal, who rose from the dead every spring in the ancient narrative. Baal originated not in Canaan, but in Babylon. They gave these gods different names at different places at different times, be it Baal, Marduk, or whatever, but they all came from Babylon. False religion originates in Babylon in the days of Nimrod and Semiramis. These mystery religions of Babylon, as I pointed out a number of times, made their way through Pergamum in Asia Minor, where Satan's throne is into the Greco-Roman world. And from there, they found their way eventually into Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, Freemasonry, etc. Now they're in the emergent church. You know the emergent church. Dan Kimball, Brian McLaren, Rick Warren, etc. But it all comes from Babylon. The serpent is there, and he's seducing the woman. Well, how does it work? Nations get the leaders they deserve, just like in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles. Oh, we have to get rid of Barack Obama. He has homosexual and lesbian picnics for Gay Pride Month on the White House lawn. What's the alternative? The Mormon who believes that Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. What a fantastic choice. The way I always put it, it's the heir to the throne of Solomon. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, which Boam do you want? Why is it like that? Because we're under God's judgment. We get the leaders we deserve. Now understand, ultimately Satan wants to be worshipped. He will use these false religions and the confederation of false religions to get people away from believing the true way of salvation in Jesus. To get people away from the gospel, he'll use any religion. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Voodoo, doesn't matter. His favorites are religions that pretend to be Christian, like liberal Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, etc. But ultimately the beast turns against the woman, doesn't he? Once they've served this purpose, no, you can't be that anymore. Now you have to just worship me. That's what it will come to. In the meantime, though, there's a confederation. You got a ball, we got a ball, everybody's got to have a ball. You got a Jesus, we got a Jesus. There's 25,000 people, according to David Hawking, in the Mexico City telephone directory, directory named Jesus. Jesus. Because you have two people named Jesus, does that mean they're the same Jesus? Because you have two people named Robert Jones in the Los Angeles telephone directory, does that mean they're the same Robert Jones? We're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I've got a burning in my bosom, and I testify to you, the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. There, Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. Does anybody think that that plastic dude on the dashboard is the real Jesus? Our Jesus said, I will come back the way I've left. He will come back by a mount of ear. His feet will one day indeed stand on the Mount of Olives. That is true. But he warned us if anyone says, I've come back physically, he's in the inner rooms, don't go there. He's in the wilderness, don't believe them, get away. Yet every time there's a mass, Roman Catholics are taught that Jesus has returned physically under the appearances of bread and wine. They kneel down to it, they worship it, they pray to it. They call it the Blessed Sacrament, don't they? Yes, they do. That's not our Jesus. The Eucharistic Jesus isn't our Jesus. He said, keep away from that. Food sacrificed to idols. Keep away from that plastic dude on the dashboard. Keep away from that spirit brother of Satan, Jesus. You got a Baal, we got a Baal. They just confused the two Baals. They confused the Canaanite Baal with Yahweh. They're confusing the Jesuses. You've got youth with a mission. 
Youth with a mission, YWAM. Danny Lehman, youth with a mission, YWAM. Youth with a mission. <laughs> Saying you can call Jesus Christ by the name of Eo, the Hawaiian volcano god. We are told in the Psalms, don't even let the name of these demon idols be on your lips. Danny Lehman. It's a shame and a disgrace for anybody to have anything to do with such an organization. This is unbelievable. It's the serpent! He wants to take God's woman. He won't have a hard time getting unbelieving Jews, believe me. He's already got them. He won't have a hard time getting the World Council of Churches or the Vatican. He's already got them. Who he wants to get is us. If possible, the elect will be deceived. Oh, but it isn't possible. No. How do you explain the fact that Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, when asked one about wars one time, rumors of wars one time, famines one time, earthquakes one time, pestilence one time, the Jews coming back to Israel one time, and that only in Luke's Gospel, one time, one time, one time, one time, one time. But he warns about deception perpetrated against the elect four times more than he warns about anything else. Now why would Jesus keep warning about deception aimed at believers four times more than he warned about anything else if it can't happen? Well, you know what? It is happening. It's happening already. It happened in Anaheim Stadium when they brought out Rick Warren. It's happening every time you tune in to TBN. It's happening as we speak. The elect are being taken for a ride. I fear, I fear for half the Calvary chapels if this is what they're doing when Brother Chuck is still around, what in the name of God is going to happen if he isn't? If that's what they're doing when he's still here, what's going to happen when he isn't? Now he's too old and too sick to take the stand he would have taken at one time. That's a tragedy. But let's understand this. He wants God's woman. And he knows how to get it. So he first tries to reason. Let's talk this over. I'll give you another chance. Everybody else is doing it. It doesn't mean anything. It's just the politically correct thing to do is to be interfaith. You know, like that book by Peter Kreeft, Ecumenical Jihad. Mohammed's in heaven, Buddha's in heaven, and we have to have ecumenical union with Islam to morally save society. I mean, Chuck Colson endorsed it before he died. I mean, J.I. Packer, the great reformed Calvinist theologian, endorses it. What's the problem? Are you more enlightened than your leaders? With leaders like that, we're in trouble. Give me a Francis Schaeffer any day. Give me an A.W. Tozer any day. Give me a Chuck Smith any day. But let's look. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in verse 16 answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning the matter. If it be so, our God whom we are serving is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. With respect, your majesty, we understand what you are saying. We understand your decree perfectly. 
We wish to make it clear that we believe with perfect faith that our God is perfectly able to deliver us from the furnace of affliction. But even if he doesn't, he's our God, not yours. He's our Jesus. Not the ecumenical one, not the Eucharistic one, not the plastic one on the dashboard, not the Mormon one, not the Islamic one, Isa, who's inferior to Mohammed. That's not our Jesus. We don't have the same Jesus. No, it's not the EO Hawaiian volcano god of youth with the mission. That's not our Jesus. That's not our Yahweh. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right, I tried to be nice with you kids. I tried to be a nice guy. I tried to reason. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated and he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their clothes and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. They were tied up. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of fire slew these men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. The first ones God judges are the persecutors of his people. Their own devices will come upon them. This goes back to Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the promise to Abraham. I'll bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee. We have Abraham's anthropological descendants, the Jews, and Abraham's theological descendants, regenerate believers. We have his descendants by birth and his descendants by second birth. Nobody who has ever persecuted the Jews, no empire, no country, no one who has ever persecuted the Jews has escaped the wrath and judgment of God. And nobody who has ever persecuted the true church has escaped the wrath and judgment of God. They've touched the apple of his eye. You mess with the Jews, you've not messed with the Jews, you've messed with the God of the Jews. You mess with those who are his true children. You've touched his son's body. Saul, why do you persecute me? You will either repent personally or he is coming after you. Amen. Nobody gets away with this. I only wish our corrupt politicians in this backslidden nation realized it because last week something happened for the first time in the history of the United States. Not to be political, I'm simply telling you. Our corrupt federal government and our godless president said, you must provide not simply birth control, but the morning after pill, abortion, as part of Obamacare, irrespective of your religious convictions. It doesn't matter if the charity is owned by Catholics, evangelicals, people, Orthodox Jews, people who object to abortion, it doesn't matter. The federal government now decrees you must kill that kid or you will be fined by the federal government. May the judgment of Christ fall on Obama and his henchmen. But the alternative is no better. Proposition 8. A homosexual judge overturned the democratic will of the people in this state. 
Who nominated that homosexual judge? Ronald Reagan. Who appointed him? George Bush. May the judgment of Christ fall. Like I said, Jeroboam or Rehoboam, which Boam do you want? Backslidden nations get the leaders they deserve. And it's going to get worse. In Great Britain, the last act as Prime Minister of Tony Blair, his last act was the sexual orientation regulation in the British Parliament. Where if you refuse to give a same-sex couple the right of adoption to take that baby out of that pram, out of that crib, to be raised as a lesbian or a homosexual, if you don't do that, you can be prosecuted by the Crown, by the British government. You've committed a hate crime. What did Jesus say? It's better to have a millstone tied around your neck than to hurt one of those little ones. You know about that in Los Angeles, don't you? They paid $660 million plus law fees to keep Cardinal Mahoney from Los Angeles out of San Quentin where he belongs. Protecting pedophile priests and nuns at the expense of not protecting the children whose lives they destroy. That's here in Los Angeles. But let's look. They're passing laws that says you must go against the word of God. What did the apostles say in the book of Acts chapter 4? Whether it's better to obey God or man, you have to say, but we have to do what we've been told. Jesus said you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. Here's the clencher. When Tony Blair was pushing that legislation through the British Parliament, he was taking instructions to convert to Roman Catholicism from the Cardinal in London who was caught protecting pedophile priests. The Roman Catholic adoption agencies have had to close down in Great Britain because of Tony Blair, but they didn't say a word. He was too big of a trophy. You understand what it's really about? It's not about religion, it's about politics, power, and money. That's what Babylon is. Religion is simply the means to get it. It's about money, power, and politics. Religion is simply the device, the propaganda, the instrument, the bait, the con game. But let's look. His facial expressions change and he's really angry. Verse 23, but these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and he stood up in haste. He responded and said to his high officials, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? And they said to the king, Certainly, O king, it was three. And he answered and said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire and responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God. Come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men nor was the hair of their head even singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies 
so not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. Their house is reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other god who's able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Now, I've got to explain a few things that are not so easy to explain. To begin with, notice they went into the furnace of affliction bound. But they came out free. They went in tied up, but they come out loosed. Nobody likes the furnace of affliction. Many people make the mistake of confusing the meaning of the Greek word ellipsis, tribulation, with the Greek word orge, wrath. Faithful believers will never experience orge, the wrath of God. But faithful believers have usually experienced ellipsis. I've said many, many times, the freedom we have in the United States or Great Britain or Australia, the Protestant democracies particularly, is a historical anomaly. You don't think of it, but the founding fathers of America were influenced by the founders of parliamentary democracy in Britain. For all their mistakes and faults, the founding fathers of America knew democracy will only work if we're governed by men, governed by God. That our laws must be based on biblical principles. Founders of British Parliament put on the outside of the Parliament, Paternoster, Quius, and Chalius, our Father who art in heaven. They understood the same. But that came from Great Britain, that influence. You see that Bible in the English language in front of you? The reason we have it is because it caused people like William Tyndale their life. People in this country may not have heard of Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Tyndale. But the freedom we have in the Protestant democracies was bought by the blood of martyrs. It was bequeathed to this country by people from Britain. A five-year-old or somebody with a fifth grade education can read the Declaration of Independence and say this is a theistic document endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Somebody with a fifth grade education can read the Constitution. Our rights come from God, not from man. Both are theistic documents, yet are corrupt courts and the ACLU, which is neither American nor civil, nor libertarian, they defended Nazis. Says you can't mention God at public events, or they want it. you can't have a cross at the World Trade Center Memorial, even though most of the families of the victims, including my own, want it there. You turn away from the God who gave you the freedom, the freedom goes out the window. That is what is happening. Remember, as I've been pointing out, Jesus said you'll be brought before magistrates and kings. We are coming into the era of judicial fascism. Corrupt courts and corrupt judges legislating from the bench. I mean, it's purely a political issue, but just look at it. That Roberts, he, he just said, no, it's not, a, it's not a fee, it's a tax. They just rewrote the law from this. <laughs> Congress is supposed to make the laws, not the court. Throw the Constitution out the window. Why? Because they no longer believe in its premise, which is a faith in God. <laughs> the Judeo-Christian heritage is gone, so the freedom it bequeathed and engendered is going. This is going to happen. They're going to make more and more laws that are inherently going to put Christians in difficult situations. We are going to have to make a choice between our faith and our politics. Our faith 
and compliance with the laws of God or compliance with the laws of our corrupt courts and our corrupt governments. Yes, by all means, pray for them that you may lead peaceable lives. But in the age in which we live, where prophecy is being fulfilled so rapidly, understand what's coming. Do not believe the lie that we will not enter the furnace of affliction. We will enter the furnace of affliction. We don't have to suffer where a king's kid name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. California Christianity. Tell that to the Christians in Vietnam who are being persecuted, but their churches are growing. Tell that to the Christians in northern Nigeria being persecuted by the Muslims, but their churches are growing. No, there's a furnace of affliction. I cannot promise you we will not enter the furnace of affliction. Sooner or later, it is inevitable. What I can promise is, one, if we go inbound, we will come out free. Yeah. Second thing I can promise you is the world will see it, but they'll see something else. One like the Son of God. His angel here is the angel of the Lord, what Jews call the Metatron. I can promise you that Jesus will be in there with you. I can promise that. He doesn't send us anywhere that he doesn't go with us. He doesn't let anybody else send us anywhere that he hasn't already been to himself. That's the second thing I can promise you. Third thing I can promise you is they came out and even the scent of the fire was not on their clothing. We have robes of righteousness. Be it by rapture or be it by resurrection. No matter what happens to us, you won't be able to tell. I read the end of the book. And because of Jesus, having read the end of the book, I assure you, despite all this bad stuff, in the end, we win. Amen. Then they'll believe. Then they will know. It was certain Jews who said no. The church, I mean the evangelical church, has become so corrupted, so heretical, so compromised, increasingly apostate, compromising on fundamental moral issues, divorce and remarriage, homosexuality, God knows what's next, even idolatry. It's going to take persecution to make the unbelievers believe. Just as it was in the early church, as Tertullian wrote, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. No, I don't desire these things. I don't relish these things. I don't cherish the prospect of these things. But I live in the real world, not the fantasy world of the televangelist con artists. But then things appear to change. The plus le change, le plus le reste de The more things change, the more they stay the same. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 6, please. Verse 1, it seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they should be in charge of the whole kingdom and over them three commissioners, one of whom was Daniel, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might suffer no loss. Thus Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. 
but they could not find any grounds of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful. And no negligence of corruption was to be found in him. He wasn't from Chicago. <laughs> then these men said, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God, the Torah. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the high officials, and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man outside of you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document. That is the injunction. He was not malintended. He was benevolent towards the Jews. But people with an agenda simply wanted to get the laws on the books. That's what they want. Get the law on the books. If you cannot get the law on the books legislatively, sign an executive order, anything, just get the law on the books. Because once it's on the books, it's very difficult to revoke it. Congress is not so much just corrupt as it is parasitic. Thanks to Congress, we have 14 million laws to explain 10 commandments. You understand a system has been created where everybody is a criminal. There is nobody watching this in the United States or in most other countries. There's nobody in this auditorium who cannot be prosecuted by the federal government for some kind of violation. They can find some violation of some description on somebody that you never heard of. They can get anybody. Now it's selective enforcement. It's politically implied. All they need is the law on the books. Forget the Constitution. Its Judeo-Christian premise has been assassinated in a godless society. Now anything goes. Supreme Courts who think they're the Supreme Being. I cannot wait for those judges to stand before the real Supreme Court. Yeah. Now order God out of the classroom. Now order God out of the maternity ward. Now order God out of the courts. But let's look. Just get the laws on the books. Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had a window open towards Jerusalem and continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Notice before he asked for anything, he thanked God. He was facing a crisis, but the first words out of his mouth were ones of thanksgiving not ones of supplication or petition. That's a good example to us for a number of reasons. If you really want to have the faith to trust God for a need, thank him for the needs he's met already. Beginning with our salvation. But let's continue. These men came by agreement in verse 11 and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man other than you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king answered and said, The statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Notice he was doing this within the confines and privacy of his own home. Forget private rights. The internet and laws that are going to come along are going to change it. 
understand what's happening. This is not a political statement, it's just reality. Governments are capitalizing on September 11th to deprive our own citizens of rights. They dare not do something sensible like revoke the green cards of immigrants from Islamic countries or stop the student visas of radical students coming to Orange County from Islamic countries. Don't do something that's going to work. Instead, pass blanket laws so you can enforce those laws against your own citizens. If people are afraid of terror, they will support these laws. Don't let us have another September 11th. They'll forfeit their own rights, freedoms. Just don't offend Islam or the Saudi Arabians. The Bush family might be out of a few bucks. Their partners in the Carlisle group. Ask them if it's true. Just think of it. After September 11th, that wicked president put a copy of the Koran, a book that says God has no son, in the White House. A book that says God has no son. What is he going to say when he stands before the sun? It was Bush who began celebrating Ramadan in the White House. But you understand the problem is not Bush and Obama. The problem is us. As nations and societies, we get the leaders we deserve. I'm not making political statements. I'm simply showing you. You can no longer separate the political realities and legal realities of the times in which we live from prophecy. The same things that happened in Daniel are going to happen now. There's something on back of all of these political and legal trends. They were always trying to placate the Babylonians. Now they're always trying to placate who? <laughs> the Muslims. Where is Babylon in the Muslim world? It's the same thing. Iran rises as a threat. Greece is in disarray. Rome is unstable and Europe has gone into the instability. 430 BC, 2012 AD. And it's going to get more like this. The political and legal pressure on believers will accumulate. Be careful of people who try to mix their political views with scripture. It doesn't work. There's no political party going to save us. Pray for whoever gets elected, but don't trust any of them. Vote as your conscience dictates, but don't think there's going to be a political savior. There won't be. Nebuchadnezzar did not want to do this, but he was manipulated and coerced into doing it anyway. It doesn't matter if a president says he's sympathetic to Christians. He's going to be manipulated and coerced into doing it anyway. We turned our backs on God. Let's look. They approached and spoke before the king. You signed it, O oh, king, for 30 days. Cast them into the lion's den. This is the law of the Medes and Persians. In verse 13, they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who's one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O oh, king, or to the injunction which you signed, but he keeps making his petition three times a day. Yeah, but he does it in the privacy of his own home. There's no privacy in your own home anymore. They can trace your cell phone anywhere you go. It's a transponder. As soon as the king heard the statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel, and even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Notice he was a benevolent politician who wanted to get Daniel off, but his hands were tied by a godless system. Even if you have a benevolent politician, his hands will be tied by a godless system. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, it's a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king established may be changed. 
We have to persecute those Christians. They must be prosecuted by the British government because they've committed a hate crime. They would not give a baby over to same-sex adoption. How long is it going to be when they're going to say to your church you are no longer tax-exempt because you denied somebody a position as pastor because they're a lesbian? That's a hate crime. It's discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Your church building is no longer tax-exempt. How long before that happens? Probably not too long. Verse 16, the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. Yeah, thank God for him. Now look at that word, deliver, in verse 16. Okay. Let's go even further. Verse 27. Who has also delivered Daniel. Okay. Verse 27. He delivers and rescues. It's the same word. And going back to chapter 2, it's there again, delivered from the furnace of affliction. Quite a word in Aramaic. Quite a word in Hebrew. It has its New Testament equivalent in a word called harpezo. In Aramaic, it's netzel, almost the same as the Hebrew natsal. I'll tell you what it means in Hebrew, same in Aramaic. To snatch away by force, to rescue forcibly. It's also a word We're pulling off a garment to put on another one, quickly. What does Paul say? The corruptible shall put on the incorruptible? You understand that these rescue narratives are types of the rapture. We will be raptured out of the furnace of affliction. We will be raptured out of the lion's den. Yes, we will enter it, but we will be rescued out of it. The wrath of God, never. Tribulation, yes. Netzel, Natsal, to be snatched out of it. Our God will rescue us by snatching us out. Myself and Danny are working on a new book called Harpezo. We'll be looking at all the things in the scripture that teach about the rapture. Let's go further with this. Your God will deliver you. That's all. Verse 17, a stone was bought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing might be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose with the dawn at the break of day and went in in haste to the lion's den. And when he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lion's den? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they've not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also towards you, O king, I've committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. 
So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Now let us understand this further. You had a political change from the Babylonian Empire to the Persian Empire. It doesn't mean if you have a political change from one party to another or one government to another, again, the more things change, the more they will stay the same. Unless a nation and a people turn to God in repentance, it doesn't matter who gets elected, they're going to do the same stuff. But let's understand it even beyond that. Daniel reached a position of political power, but it availed him nothing. Any position we have, or even getting Christians in position of power, are not going to avail them in the face of the persecution gets serious enough. Now understand this. All of Israel's prophets prophesied for three time frames. Most of you know that. They prophesied for their own time. They prophesied for the first coming of Christ. And they prophesied eschatologically for the second coming of Christ. They prophesied for their own time. They prophesied messianically and eschatologically. Except Daniel. Daniel prophesied for four time frames. For his own time, for the time of the Maccabees, which foreshadows what's going to happen with the Antichrist and Antiochus Epiphanes, for the first coming of Jesus, as we'll see tomorrow, and for the return of Jesus, Daniel actually prophesies for four times, remarkably. But understand this, like all of Israel's prophets, he's a type, a shadow of Christ. Remember when Jesus was in the tomb? They put the stone in front of the tomb and they put the imperial seal of Pilate so nobody could disturb it. And at dawn, he comes out. What happens to Daniel? He goes in, he's as good as dead. The seal is put on the stone, the stone's rolled away. He comes out alive at dawn. He's a type of Christ, he's a shadow of Jesus. All of these Hebrew prophets are shadows of types of Jesus. Jesus is always the invisible character in all of these Old Testament narratives. Sometimes, in the furnace of affliction, he's visible. But again, it says God sent his angel. When you see the definite possessive, his angel, or the definite article, the angel, again, it's the angel of the Lord. It's Jesus. It's a Christophany. Jesus will always be there, even in the lion's den, even in the furnace of affliction. He comes out at dawn alive because he trusted in his God. Verse 24, the king then gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel. And they cast them, their children, their wives into the lion's den and they had not even reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may our, your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever. His kingdom in which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues. He delivers and raptures. That's exactly what it says. <coughs> and performs signs and wonders. Nisim vanipla oath in heaven and on earth, just like in Joel, just like in Revelation, like in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. The language becomes eschatological. <coughs> Who has also raptured Daniel from the power of the lions. 
So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian and Darius the Mede. Then they reestablished Jerusalem with decrees, didn't they? They sent Ezra and Nehemiah back to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Now understand, that's what's going to happen in the last days. After the resurrection, after the rapture, we go into the millennial reign of Christ and there'll be a reestablishment of the kingdom to the Jews. The promise of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. Is that at this time you'll restore the kingdom. The whole thing is a picture. It's a type. Yes, it is history, but it is not just past history. It is future history. When did people believe? When God's people were in the furnace of affliction. What made them believe? When God's people were in the lion's den. Once again, Jesus was in there with them. It doesn't matter if you go in dead. You're coming out alive. It doesn't matter what happens. There is going to be a rescue. There is going to be a harpezo. There is going to be a rapture. That is exactly, precisely what it says. Natsal. Netzal. That's the way it was. That's the way it is. And that's the way it's going to be when Jesus comes. Don't fear the furnace of affliction. Don't fear the lion's den. The thing to fear is not being one of the Jews who stood their ground. The thing to fear is not being like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, unlike Daniel. Being one of the Christians who will not compromise. Don't fear that. Despite what appears to be the temporal consequences, don't fear that. Don't worry. Jesus will be in there with you. He's not sending you anywhere. He's not going to be with you. Guaranteed. What? The fear is not being one of the people of God who don't compromise and are willing to pay the price. What we should fear is those who do compromise. That's what we should fear. That's what we need to be afraid of. And as we speak, too much of the church are compromising already. You can call it Natsal. You can call it Netzel. You can call it Rapture. You can call it Harpezo. One way or another, Jesus is going to get us out of here. God bless. Other people have thought you could cause a revival to happen by imitating the priests of Baal. So they went to Toronto, Canada, or to Pensacola, Florida, and they began imitating the priests of Baal, with whom Elijah contended, thinking they could make a revival happen. But of course, that doesn't work either. Some people said by looking at the way a revival or a move of God is happening in one place, if you imitate it, you just need the formula to make it happen someplace else. Well, that certainly doesn't work, because there's no outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. There are indeed principles. There are indeed principles to see churches grow. But remember, biblically and historically, every revival has begun with people weeping. None has begun with people laughing. If revival does come, it will only come the way it has always come. It'll come by the church repenting. If the church does not repent, there will be no revival. There will be no outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Having said that, Every one of us, every one of us can have a revival in our own life. Every one of us can return to our first love, as Jesus told the Ephesians. So if you had any given church, and every person in that church returned to their first love, 
that church would have a revival and it would spread. That's the only guaranteed formula for revival. <laughs> Returning to our first love. Unless there's a repentance, there will not be a revival. You'll have counterfeits of revival, you'll have con artist revivals, you'll have people calling things revival that aren't. You'll have nonsense. You'll have a Toronto, a Pensacola, a Lakeland. You'll have this kind of thing. But you're not going to have a revival. You'll have a new apostolic reformation, but you won't have a revival. It doesn't matter what program you get, 40 days of purpose, 40 days of fast, none of those things work. All you're going to get is people leaving one church for another to see the latest show in town. Once the show is over, they'll go find another show. The world will always have better rock concerts. The world will always have better entertainment. None of these things will work. None of these things can work. The question this morning is, how do we evangelize a post-Christian, neo-pagan world? What did Jesus say? Preach the gospel of the kingdom. In the 1970s, Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, <clears throat> was a very superficial treatment of eschatology. I don't even consider it to be a serious book, theologically. However, many, many people were saved through that book. Why were so many people saved through that book? There's no magic formula. He simply did what Jesus said to do. He used end-time prophecy to present the gospel. There was an evangelist in New Zealand and the South Pacific named Barry Smith. Tremendously effective in the South Pacific in seeing people get saved. He was somebody who had very shallow doctrine. He was somebody who would go with all kinds of nonsense like Y2K and things. All kinds of nonsense. But many people came to faith through his ministry. He had no magic formula. But he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He used end time prophecy to see people saved. This is what Jesus said to do, preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's why we produced the Daniel Project, and there's a companion book called The Daniel Factor. Now let's understand this even further. Why will people go to fortune tellers? Why will people go to astrology and the occult and things like this? Well, they want to know the future. People want to know the future. We know the future. The people in the Pentagon and in the CIA and the State Department and in the White House and our crooked politicians, they're trying to figure out the way the world is going, the way it's evolving. Well, the scriptures tell us there will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. We know how things will end in the Middle East. We know how things will end in Europe. We know how things will end globally. We know the Word of God tells us. Now, instead of focusing on what Jesus told us to focus on, you can bet that Satan does not want us to do that. Hence, Satan has a counter plan to make sure the church does not do what Jesus said. Only telling you the facts. Three weeks ago on YouTube, I watched Mark Driscoll mocking Christians who study end time prophecy. Jesus said, be alert, preach the gospel of the kingdom, watch out for this stuff. Mark Driscoll was mocking it. He was belittling people who did it as if they were all a lot of conspiracy theorists obsessed with the Illuminati. He defined other Christians by the lunatic fringe. Why is he doing that? <laughs> Another stunt. Something that is unbelievable. I thought I'd seen it all. Something that a Jehovah's Witness would not attempt. Something a cult would not have the audacity to attempt to perpetrate has been perpetrated in the church. And it's unbelievable who's believing it. Look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 1. The last thing Jesus said. Verse 6. And when they had come together on the Mount of Olives on Hazayatim, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the epics the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. The apostles were Jews. What they were asking the Lord Jesus is this. 
We know you're the suffering servant who atoned for sin. We now understand that. You have to come twice. Once as a suffering servant, once as a conquering king. In Judaism, this is known as Hamashiach ben Yosef, Hamashiach ben David. As believers, we know it's one Messiah, two comings. We know you came to atone for sin. But when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The throne of David must be restored. When are you going to restore the kingdom? In other words, the millennium. That's what they were asking him. They were Jews and they understood the Messiah must fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies in the Tanakh. Jesus only fulfilled the suffering servant prophecies in his first coming. He has yet to fulfill the millennial prophecies reigning from the throne of David. That's what they were asking him on the Mount of Olives before he went. And he says, it's not for you to know the time that's going to happen. Your priority should be evangelism. That's what he said. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. Verse 3, once again on the Mount of Olives, for the first time, he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, what will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And he says, see that no one misleads you. Then he goes through a long list of things to watch out for. In verse 14 he says, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world. For a witness to the nations, then the end shall come. In other words, we use kingdom come, we use these prophecies of him coming to establish the messianic kingdom as a way to evangelize people. Then he goes on further, talking more about the end, and he sums this up by saying in verse 42, Therefore be alert, you do not know which hour your Lord is coming. Jesus says, watch out for this, watch out for this, watch out for this. Preach the gospel of the kingdom. Use end time prophecy to evangelize and be alert. Watch out for this stuff. The book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible with a specific promise, a specific promise in it for reading it. Whole books of the Bible are primarily dedicated to the return of Jesus. Not just Revelation. Both epistles to the Thessalonians. Their main theme is eschatology. You have eschatological content in Romans. You have it in uh, Corinthians. You have it in Peter. Then we have it in James. Throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew prophets are rife with unfulfilled predictive material about the coming of Jesus. And Daniel, in Zechariah, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Obadiah, in Zephaniah. Be alert. Watch out for this. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. If you go to the Purpose Driven website, this is what Rick Warren says. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. Now how does he get this? The new hermeneutic, translocation. Bring up the text of the New Testament in your mind's eye and take the mouse in your right hand. Highlight Matthew chapter 24 verse 3. Highlight it. What will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age? And do a cut and paste. Go to Acts chapter 1. Highlight verse 6. Highlight it and delete it. Throw Acts 1, verse 6, out of the text. And then paste Matthew 24, verse 3, where verse 6 of Acts chapter 1 used to be. So now it will read, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? It's not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has fixed that is exactly what Rick Warren did. Cut and paste hermeneutics. Cut and paste asegesis, not exegesis. Anybody can cut one verse out of one book and delete a verse in another book and 
paste it in where the other one used to be. You can make it say anything. That's why his Bible of choice is the message by Eugene Peterson, because the Word of God does not teach that stuff, so he has to get a make-believe Bible, what Peter calls a logos plastios, literally a plastic Bible, a fabricated Word of God. It's unbelievable! A Jehovah's Witness would not pull a stunt like that. Jesus says, be alert! Who cares what he said? Rick Warren says, keep away from it. The New Testament says, watch out for this, watch out for this, watch out for this. Who needs the New Testament? We have the purpose-driven lie. Who cares what Jesus Christ said when you have Mark Driscoll? Who needs Jesus Christ when you have Rick Warren? Who needs Daniel or Obadiah? Who needs Paul? when we have motivational speakers whose doctrines are framed by marketing psychology and psychobabble. Jesus warned people like this would come in the last days. Let no one deceive you. But they're being deceived. In England we have a proven false prophet, a proven false prophet, Gerald Coates who says the rapture is a fantasy and a myth. In the United States, you have a proven false prophet, a proven false prophet, Rick Joyner, who says the rapture is a lie of the devil. You have another proven false prophet, a proven false prophet, Mike Bickle. Men who predicted things that are time-specific in God's name that never happened. Proven false prophets by biblical definition. Mike Bickle says, the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. If you don't believe there's a rescue, how are you going to be rescued? They think it's a joke. Satan has raised these deceivers up to mislead the church. The foolish virgins will not have batteries in their flashlights. Oh, they'll have the flashlights, but what good is a flashlight without a battery? What good is a lamp without oil? Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The illumination of the Holy Spirit is not in their understanding of Scripture because they have no understanding. It's all hype. It's extra contextual. It's false. It's dangerous. It's misleading the church. And when I see people, people who I know know better, when I see people like Piper, who I've never trusted and never respected anyway, he's a replacement theologian, he was not worth a dime anyway as a Bible teacher. When I see Piper backing this Rick Warren stuff, when I see people who should know better, like Greg Laurie, sanctioning somebody like that, when I see people who I know know better, they know better, misleading their flocks into following these deceivers, we are heading for trouble. The heart of Jeremiah's polemic against false prophets is found in chapter 23. That's the heart of his polemic against false prophets. And he says, in the last days you will understand this, in verse 20. In other words, it's eschatological. He was not just speaking for his own day, he was speaking for the last days. But he opens his rendition, his polemic, with oi the roim, woe to the shepherds, woe to the pastors. You hear what I'm saying? The problem is not the false prophets, and the problem is not the false teachers. This is what the problem is. The pastors who will not protect the sheep from these wolves. That's the problem. You're the problem, Greg Laurie. You're the problem, John Piper. You're the problem. You're feeding the sheep of Christ to the wolves, and you know better. And you will give account on the day of judgment unless you repent. Amen. 
Hit me with a pie, hit me with a stone, shoot me dead. I'll see you at the judgment seat of Christ and we'll find out who's right. I'm ready, are you? I take no joy in saying these things. I take no delight in saying these things. But when people will chase numbers or money or fame or something like that at the expense of truth, a real man of God would rather preach the truth to 50 people than preach a mixture of truth and error to 50,000. Watch out for these things, Jesus said. Be alert and watch out. As we speak, global events are unfolding very quickly. More quickly than anyone can keep up with. Generally, we focus on Israel, and we should. But there's another dimension to that equation. There's another factor in it. That is the countries that were in and around the Mediterranean, including the countries that constituted the ancient Roman Empire. Turn with me, please. Once again, as Marco was last night, we'll pick up where Brother Marco left off, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel Hanavi. In verses 31 through 35, we see the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Much like the image in chapter 3, it is a type, a foreshadowing of the image of the beast. The Shikutsa Meshul Mem that we looked at last night, again, gold, the head, that's the mentality of the world. The world thinks in terms of wealth, but also gold is a non-corrosive metal. Unsaved people want to deify themselves and perpetuate themselves ad infinitum into eternity by their own means. That was what was on back of the Tower of Babel. That's what is on back of what's happening today. Anything that fallen man can use for evil, he will use for evil. Science, technology, those things can be used for good. But in the harmatosphere, in the fallen world, anything fallen man can use for evil will be used for evil. The world is in the power of the wicked one. You can use radioactive isotopes to treat cancer. You can also use radioactivity and weapons of mass destruction. Anything fallen man can use for evil will ultimately be used for evil. Unless these things are subordinated to the rule of Christ, they're going to be used for evil. Gold, corresponding to the Babylonian Empire, silver. The word for silver in Hebrew is kesef. It's also the word for money. Look where it's located. What the people really have in their hearts. My favorite rabbi made the following statement. My favorite rabbi said, Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. My favorite rabbi was Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef, Bin Tzedek, Rabbi Jesus of Nazareth. Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. Mani. Two arms, the Median and the Persian Empire, then the Bronze. The Greek Empire, they seemed invincible. But again, as Marco pointed out, that is the pelvic region where reproductive organs are located. The seminal influence on Western civilization and most of the rest of the world much of the rest of the world is Hellenistic. You can even go to countries in the far east, like Japan and Singapore. Although they have an Eastern culture, they're still Hellenized. They're still Westernized. Australia, New Zealand, doesn't matter geographically where they are. Directly or indirectly, they all come from Greece, the Greco-Roman world. And even if they don't, even if they retain an Asian character, like Korea, or Japan, or Singapore, you see the influence of the West is still there. Just go to Japan, they've got Yaku, baseball, they've got Disneyland. The influence of the Western civilization is inescapable. 
The book of Acts only traces the spread of the gospel in one direction, to the west. Then comes the iron, two legs, the Greco-Roman Empire had the Byzantine Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman. You always had a Greek-speaking east and a Latin-speaking west, and then they eventually split. But then something comes out of it with feet of iron and clay. The next one, please. Can we change the PowerPoint, please? Iron and clay. Let's continue reading Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. There'll be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron inasmuch as it crushes and shatters all things. So the iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. And in that, you, your feet, you saw, and toes are partially of potter's clay and partially of iron. It will be divided kingdom, but it will have in it toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And as the toes of the feet were partially of iron and partially of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with the common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. Now in verse 35, we see the picture of the return of Christ. He will come and he will hit the feet of that monstrosity. The book of Daniel can be summed up as God's judgment on the political economic structure of the fallen world that will eventually come under the domain of the Antichrist. It'll be God's judgment with the return of Christ. Continuing in Daniel 2 at verse 44, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. <coughs> it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it itself will endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain without hands, and it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Understand that what happens, what this stands on, are centuries of human civilization, dating back to ancient Babylon, dating back to ancient Persia, <coughs> dating back to ancient Rome and Greece. But it's the feet that get struck when the eternal Christ comes. That's where the judgment will fall. Western civilization. Different people have interpreted the ten toes differently. Some people have tried to assert that those ten toes correspond to the nations in Psalm 83. That is speculative at best because those nations do not come out of the Roman Empire. Those are Middle Eastern nations. Additionally, depending on how you count them, there can variously be either 9 or 11. 10 is an arbitrary calculation. Not a very good argument. Others have tried to say there's a correspondence between the 10 toes and the 10 horns. Again, the only thing they have in common is the ten. That's purely speculative. Looking at modern events, you have to understand the way Europe is now. Twenty-five countries, but not really. The countries that are important in Europe are the countries that are both in the European Union and in NATO. Those countries that are in the European Union and in NATO are the iron. You're speaking of Great Britain, France, Germany. You're speaking of <coughs> Holland, Italy, <coughs> Spain. These are the countries. <coughs> There's ten countries that are in the NATO that are also in the European Union. At the heart is Britain, Germany, Italy, and France. 
the other countries are held in their orbit, economically, strategically, and politically. Europe is a mixture of strong countries and weak ones. They had this idea after the Second World War to have a treaty in Rome. It was born in Rome. There had been other people who had tried to revive the Roman Empire historically. Charlemagne tried. It didn't really work. Napoleon tried. It didn't really work. Benito Mussolini tried. It didn't really work. Other people have tried to revive the Roman Empire. This time it's different. To begin with, it's both East and West. Countries like Greece are in it as well as countries like Britain. It truly recapitulates the countries that were in the Roman Empire. That's never happened before. People have tried to make it happen, but it's never happened. The idea was we can be like America. America won the First World War in league with Britain. America won the Second World War in league with Britain. And America rebuilt Europe with the Marshall Plan after the wars. And then America won the Cold War, ultimately, mainly in league with Britain. It was mainly America and Britain who won all three, the First World War, the Second World War, and the Cold War, not the countries of continental Europe. During the Cold War, Americans spent more money defending Europe than Europe did. France hit on back of the Anglo-American shield. They let us pick up the bill for it. The idea was these countries have had it. France is a has-been empire. The only reason Great Britain has remained a player on the global stage is they play second fiddle to their American cousins. So Britain still had a certain degree of power and influence in the world residually through the Commonwealth, what used to be the Empire, and by being in league with America through what's known as the Special Relationship. But these other countries in Europe, the Spanish Empire is long gone. The Congo is no longer ruled by Belgium. They're all finished. So their thinking was what it says in Proverbs, let us have one purse. If we amalgamate, if we all come together, Europe can be a player again on the global stage. We can be like America if we unite and have a United States. That was their thinking. But they've got problems. America is by nature multicultural, multi-ethnic. But it's monolingual. One currency, doesn't matter. You're here today. If you are an Italian American and you've never been to Italy, you may think of yourself as an Italian because your name is Pacelli and your mother makes great lasagna. <laughs> I guarantee if you get off an airplane in Rome or Milan, within 10 minutes, you're going to find out you're not an Italian. The Italians will consider you to be American. You may be a Polish American because your name is Wazinski and you like to eat kibasi and you dance the polka at your cousin's wedding. <laughs> you get off that plane in Warsaw within 10 minutes, you're going to find out you're not Polish, you're American. You may consider yourself to be an African. When Afro Americans go to Africa, they find out that they are not. Afro-Americans. They're just Americans to the Africans. I saw a documentary on TV with black Americans who went to Nigeria. And they were in the hotel. And they were being told, don't go to that neighborhood. There's too many Africans down there. You'll get mugged. <laughs> they were saying the same thing to each other that white people say about them in Chicago. They found out pretty quickly that they were not Africans. It doesn't matter. That would be true of Irish Americans, it would be true of Greek Americans, and when Americans who are Jewish go to Israel, they find out there's a big difference between Israelis and American Jews.
to begin with, they have to live in fear. So they don't elect, they, you won't find Jews overwhelmingly voting for liberals. <laughs> think. Yet Europe thought it can become a monolith. Once that happens, you're going to have weak countries and strong ones. So they make the euro. Now understand what can happen very, very easily. The predecessor to the euro was called the ERM, the exchange rate mechanism. They'd have a fixed exchange rate between the Deutschmark, the French franc, the German, the British pound, etc. All you would need between the U.S. dollar set by the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the euro, an ERM between the dollar and the euro to bring global the base. World currency. All, all you would need is an exchange if it's one for one. Just exchange rates and interest rates keep those currencies locked. The Swiss franc, the Japanese yen would all have one world currency. As you get along with no cash in your pocket, all you need is plastic. Right now, all you need is plastic. I travel all over the world. I used to make sure I had a couple of hundred. I don't need that anymore. I need 30, 40 bucks in a plastic. We know where this is going. Now the fact that we know where it's going should be obvious. The world doesn't know. I accept the fact the world doesn't know, but we do know. Yet we're being told to ignore it. We're seeing it mocked from pulpits. To bring stability to global markets, they will do things internationally. Everybody knows that Mr. Obama had a failed stimulus package of about a trillion dollars. Everybody knows that America owes China a trillion dollars. Do you realize the Federal Reserve European banks? Nobody knows about that. You think it's going to get paid back? We printed that much to save the European banking system as we owe China. Nobody says anything. Let's understand what else happens. Those bankers in Wall Street are not stupid people. They're crazy people, but they're not stupid. Understand this. The Chinese are in a predicament. They've undervalued their own currency to subsidize exports. The reason you go to Walmart and buy stuff so cheap, who do you think is paying for it? The Chinese are paying for it with inflation domestically. They have inflation to subsidize stuff being cheap for us. But as long as their economy is expanding, that's okay. But now their economy is slowing. In the valued dollars, you understand, will make money on those loans. And the, but the Chinese cannot junk the dollar as the currency reserves because they'd hurt their own portfolio. 
But more importantly, they have no place to go. The Americans timed it exactly. The euro crisis. What currency are you going to go to? You can't go to the euro. They timed it exactly. Take the Chinese to the Chinese cleaners. Remember 20 years ago, everybody was saying take America as the number one world power? Now they've been eclipsed by China. Japan had five recessions. Five recessions in 11 years. Japanese corporations ran on the old shogun model of Japanese nationalism. The headquarters of Honda is in California, not in Tokyo. It's over. Fear and anxiety among the knowing the way out. It used to be a concern about defaulting on debt. That concern 20 years ago. Now Moody's and Standard & Poor's are devaluing American debt. French Japan. Public debt in Japan is 200% of gross domestic product. For every yen they produce in terms of goods and services, they owe two. The United States is between 60 and 70 percent. Between 60 and 70 percent of gross domestic product is now debt. Debt is equal 60 to 70 percent. Japan is 200 percent. It's going to hit the wall. It's going to hit the wall big time. And when it does, they will do anything to get out of it. 2008 was the cartoon before the movie, I assure you. <laughs> Something is going to happen. Geographically, from the point of view of the Middle East and of Europe, those were the countries we're in the ascent at that time. But it goes beyond that, of course. It is global. Stick to the clay. Something more last night. Do we have anybody here who's of German or Austrian descent? Put your hand up. Okay. Do we have anybody here who's of Irish descent? Put your hand up. Okay. Do we have anybody here who's of Italian descent? Put your hand up. Do we have anybody here who's of Polish or Slavic descent? Put your hand up. Somebody in Poland is Slavic, somebody in Italy is Latin, somebody in Ireland is Celt, somebody in Germany is Germanic. What's the only thing they have in common? Is it cuisine? No. no. Is it language? No. Is it anthropological ethnicity? No. Is it culture? No. Is it history? Somebody in Dublin, Ireland. Unicorn. You got the cash, we got the absolution. Amen. <laughs> you understand? Religion is simply the mechanism. That's why they must push the interfaith ecumenical agenda. That's why they want to go back to Mother Rome. It's not about religion. Europe is post-Christian neo-pagan. Europe is the way America is going. And going fast. They must make the iron stick to the clay. Britain is penalized for its efficiency. It has the most efficient farms in Europe. But they pay more into Europe for the common agricultural policy than they get out. Britain has to 
paid to subsidize underperforming, mismanaged farms in other countries in Europe. You've got to pick up the bill for those who are not as productive as you are. Germany and Holland get Without them, the countries of Southern Europe would nosedive. Ireland is broke. The Celtic Tiger is dead. It's a mess. Iran emerges as a strategic threat to the West. Greece is in crisis. Rome is in turmoil, spreading instability in Europe. 430 B.C. It's exactly what happened in 430 B.C. It's exactly what happens in 2012 A.D. If you don't understand history, you won't understand prophecy. They must make the iron stick to the clay. So if Germany says, that's it, we're not going to bail you out anymore, Greece, we'll go back to the Deutschmark. People in Spain and Greece and Italy will love that. Now they can do what China does to America. They can undervalue their currency and export to Germany and get themselves out of it. <laughs> So Germany has a choice. Pick up your bill or you underprice us. <laughs> is that? Clip one way or another. But we have to make the iron stick to the clay. They don't understand there's a satanic power on back of it. It makes no economic sense. It makes no political sense. These are has-been empires. They are has-beens. Let's go back. 430 liberated from the Iron Curtain when it collapsed. 430 million. Most of Europe are left wing. They're Euro socialists. They're like Barack Obama. That's where they are. The same stuff that, 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 that's brought about the crisis in these countries is what America's doing. And it's not just Obama. Bush was doing it as well. Now understand how this works. <clears throat> if the European left had their way, the Iron Curtain would Don't. But when the Soviets pointed the SS-20 at Frankfurt and at Brussels and at London, he deployed the cruise missiles backed by the British at Moscow and Leningrad. Reagan expanded this. Another arms race. They bankrupted the Soviet empire. It was collapsing anyway under the weight of its own inefficiency, and the arms race brought it down. If the European left had their way, those 430 million people would still be living under the communists. You understand? When the European left had their way in the 1930s in France and in England, Hitler was allowed to We live in a fallen world. Peace has only ever come through strength. It has never come through weakness. Would you see these visionary utopians talking about we have to win by peace and love and all of this? They're not living in the real world. The real world is fallen. You can talk about war. Now understand this. Because of a low birth rate and because of non-therapeutic abortion, Europe is democratic. Because his are also of Hellenistic European descent, the Spaniards and Portuguese intermarried with the indigenous people, Latin Americans are westernized. They are our immigrants. 
Muslims are Europe's immigrants. You go to the south of the USA, you have Latin America, mainly. Or other countries that are also French-speaking, Spanish-speaking, Portuguese-speaking, Haiti, whatever. You go to the south of Europe, Allahu Akbar! Birmingham, England. The banlieue of Paris, surrounding Paris. Bradford, England. Holland. They don't have European cities anymore. The average European couple has a birth rate of 1.2. The average Muslim family, if you can believe it, the average birth rate, 8.2. There are more Muslims in India, in India, not even a Muslim country, a mainly Hindu country. There are more Muslims in India than there are people in Russia. Within 10 years, 50% of the Russian army will be made up of Muslim soldiers. It's easy to see how a Gog and Magog scenario can emerge. Within 10 years! Now understand this, it makes no sense. Putin is under the threat of Islam himself because of Chechnya. Look what happened in Moscow. It makes no sense for that man to be backing Iran. But he's so resentment of having lost the Cold War. He hates America and the West so much. Stability in the Middle East to artificially drive up the price of Russian natural gas and oil. That he's backing people who will turn on him in a minute. It makes no logical sense what he's doing. He's under a bigger threat from Islam than we are. What, what does Ezekiel say? Thus saith the Lord, I will put hooks in your jaws and pull you in. He's an arrogant stooge being set up for something. And he doesn't even know it. We're supposed to know it. We are supposed to understand why Putin is doing something so stupid. God has put hooks in his jaws. Try to tell that to people in the Pentagon or the CIA or the State Department or the White. They wouldn't, they, they'd think you were crazy. They'd put hooks in your jaws. <laughs> we know. At least we're supposed to know. No, avoid end time. Yeah, he's a great guy, says John Piper. Listen to him. He's a great guy, says Mark Driscoll. Listen to Rick Warren. We're supposed to be as ignorant and unprepared as the world. You understand what's happening? There has been who are trying to unite to be a somebody again, but to claim. Yet they will do everything and anything to make it happen artificially. Ultimately, the return of the Lord will bring it all down not just Europe, but everything that's built on Western civilization will come crumbling down with it. You realize even if the American economy recovered, one crisis in Asia or Europe can bring us down with them? It's too integrated now. The national solutions, economically. Others would say environmentally and, and, and to terror, there can only be international solutions. When people get afraid, they'll... I 
I've been hearing the accusation leveled against people like myself who look at the prophetic significance of these events. That's they actually say, you're a doomsdayist. Instead of being a real Christian and working for peace and justice, you want to see these terrible things happen to bring you to the scenario. saying scripture says they will happen the only way that these things can tarry be delayed is if there's a repentance in the church and a real revival that affects society I'd rather see these things delayed so more people will get saved but unless the church preaches the gospel of the kingdom that won't happen Satan does not want the church to preach the gospel of the kingdom because that will work he wants the purpose-driven lie because it won't. But let's continue. They will not adhere to one another, but it says something else. They will combine with one another in the seed of man. We have to understand what this means. Let's begin with our school system. No matter how much money you spend state education, the more the budgets, the worse the schools become. Year after year after year, particularly in math and science scores, the foreign language abilities of American students are lagging well on back of other developed countries. There are those who have argued that the teachers unions don't even represent teachers. They are simply political campaign funds for liberal politicians. You can't fire bad ones because of tenure. A bad teacher gets as paid as much as a good one and you can't even fire them. Not getting any better. Now logically, logically, you have to realize the school system before it was corrupted by John Dewey, before it was corrupted, even in its ideal form, it was designed to prepare people to work in a factory culture, a manufacturing economy. The teachers, the foreman. Now we are in a post-industrial economy. Is outsourced. More and more work is done in cottage and more work is done at home. Logically and rationally, to more education should be done at home and in small community based private schools because that's the way the economy is going. You see, these big corporations, they outsource everything they can to cottage industries, to small companies. So we can compete. Economically, the school system needs to be junked. It's a dinosaur. They're feeding a dinosaur it needs to be junked. It needs to be replaced, just economically. But they won't replace it. Why? Because it's not about education. It's about social engineering. It's about usurping the responsibility and authority of parents of their children. Yes. To indoctrinate children at a young age, homosexuality, heter you know, the bisexuality, transgender sexuality, that these things are normative. It is to indoctrinate children at an age that all religions are co equally religions are co-equally valid. All religions do lead to the same place, the pit of hell. And that they're right. <laughs> Nobody ever went to heaven because of religion. 
Many people, countless people, have gone to hell because of religion, but nobody has ever gone to heaven because of religion. You only go to heaven because of Jesus Christ. But the schools say you can't teach that anymore. It's about social engineering. It's not just the multiracial, multi-ethnic thing. That's not what it's about. It's a political agenda. One in Christ. To me, it doesn't matter. I don't care if somebody was born Asian, African, European. I couldn't care less. I wouldn't care if you're a Martian. I wouldn't care what you were born. I only care if you're born again. Jew and Gentile. For us, unity is not based on second birth. World, it's based on birth. Do you think they're going to bring about where Jesus said nation will rise against nation? The word there in Greek is ethnon, not political nation. <coughs> in Hebrew terms, it's not the t goy. The word goy nation is an ethnic term. It's not a national term. The national term would be marhut. Loisa goy le goy hereb, nation will not lift sword against nation. <clears throat> when he said nation will turn against nation, he's talking about ethnic conflict. Now by ethnic conflict, I don't know Koreans in Los Angeles don't like the black people, and that the white people and the black people don't get on the Hispanics are angry at the gringos. I don't mean that. You should see what happened in Yugoslavia. Serbs and Croats, white on white, murdering each other. You should see what happened in Burundi with the Hutus and Tutsis, black on black, murdering each other. The killing fields in Cambodia, yellow on yellow, killing each other. If it wasn't skin color, it's going to be something else. Tribal. It goes well beyond the as we think of race and skin color. In Sri Lanka, the Salinese and the Tamils, they hate each other. They hate each other. These ethnic tensions are going to increase. The way to bring about harmony in a multi-ethnic world where people are born in different races is with a second birth. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. They're going to fight. If it's not going to be black on white, it's going to be black on black, but they're going to fight. They're going to kill each other. Now, politicians will play the race card or the Hispanic card or whatever. They'll play those cards to get elected. But that's not what it's about. about they will unite in the seed of men to bring about a harmony that can't otherwise transpire let's understand this turn with me please to Leviticus 18 verse 9 You are to keep my statutes. You are not to breed together two kinds of your cattle. So your field with two kinds of seed, nor wear a garment upon you of two kinds of material mixed together. Look with me, please, to Deuteronomy 22, verse 9. Not, not so your vineyard with two kinds of seed. Lest all the produce of the seed which you have sown and the increase of the vineyard become defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear material mixed of wool and linen together. You shall make yourself tassels for the corners of your garment. In other words, keep the Torah. Why does God hate the mixture? 
The Hebrews could not make a garment of wool and flax. Don't mix the seed. If you've been to Laodicea, you know there are there are the cold springs, and then there's the springs where the two mix and the water is lukewarm. You got the hot ones and the cold ones, but the lukewarm ones, Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth. He hates this mixture of hot and or one or the other. He hates the mixture. And he hates the mixture for a plethora of reasons. I've explained this before, but very briefly, look with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. False prophets arose among the people, false teachers among you. Notice how Peter uses false teachers and false prophets interchangeably, as if they were synonyms. Why? If their doctrines are wrong, their prophecies will be wrong. Why does Benny Hinn predict things that don't happen? Why does Cindy Jacobs predict things that don't happen? Why does Bill Johnson and Cheyenne and Peter Wagner prophesy things that don't happen? Why does Rick Joyner always seem to get it wrong? Their prophecies are wrong because their doctrines are wrong. God's not going to reveal something predictable. They won't be able to determine if it's from him or not. They have no basis to assess it. They'll come among you in the church and they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing destruction upon themselves. Secretly introduce destructive heresies. Difficult to translate from Greek. Para sogzusin. Para sogzusin. They put truth next to Well, Rick Warren says some truth. We shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We should eat the meat and spit out the bones. That's what they think. No parasolzulsin is a homogenous solution. A bottle of water with a teaspoon of arsenic. You want a sip? I'll just swallow the water and spit out the arsenic. Good luck, Charlie. He hates the mixture. A little leaven, lump. Peter Creek's book, Ecumenical Jihad, endorsed by J.I. Packer and by the late Chuck Colson. We have to have ecumenical union with Islam to morally save society. Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan, uniting with Islam, Buddhism. This is mixing the seed. No, we have a pure seed. The seed of Abraham is not to be mixed. You can't stop the world from mixing the seed. They're going to do it. But when the church does it, once again, we've got a big problem. But it is going to go beyond this. Everything fallen man can use for evil, he will. Anything fallen man can use for evil will be used for evil, I assure you. Biogenetic engineering. I first warned of this over 20 years ago. They're engineering rats genetically with 1% human DNA. You think it's impossible to eventually have a rat with human intelligence? I don't deny that these monsters in the book of Revelation are figurative. But I'm no longer positive some of them won't be literal. Mixing the seed! Since the 1970s, I've become acutely aware of the fact that many unsaved people believe an extraterrestrial life is going to save us. <laughs> One of the world's most vehement, adamant Darwinists 
and most hostile opponents of Christianity is a, some, a professor from, from England, from, Oxford, uh, from Cambridge, Stephen Do uh, Richard Dawkins. He's arrogant. When finally forced to admit in debates with Christian scientists who were creationists that there's no auto-encryption, his argument was, well, maybe extraterrestrial life seeded the Earth with DNA. They'd rather believe in flying saucers than in the Bible, in the God of Scripture. Somehow that's more logical to them. Remember, the Antichrist and false prophet are going to show signs in the sky. I've been saying this since the 70s. The Hebrew term, lipor, to fall down. Nafal, to fall down. Nephilim, the ones who fall down from the sky. We read about it in Jude's epistle. The seed says Daniel. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus was emphatic. He did not say, it will be the way it was in the days of Noah. That's not what he said. He's emphatic. He says, just as it was in the days of Noah, in verse 37 of Matthew 20. It'll be exactly like the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, what was the last straw? The mixing of seed with demonoids. You understand? Western countries will try to restrict biogenetic engineering from cloning humans. It's only a matter of time before a third world dictator will allow it to take place in his country. Just think, we won't need suicide bombers who are Muslims. We can just make clones who will do it for us. We can get slaves to work in the factories and the farms. We'll make a subculture of humanoids. We'll engineer them quite a thing, but it's no longer science fiction. It'll go beyond that. With the Enlightenment, you had a separation of science and the occult. Before the Enlightenment, astronomy and astrology was the same thing, going back to the ancient Greeks and so forth. With the Enlightenment, astronomy, science went that way, astrology went that way, that's the superstition, the occult. Before the Enlightenment, magic and chemistry and physics were all the same, alchemy. With the Enlightenment, chemistry and physics went that way, magic went the other way. Folk medicine went one way, medicine and pharmacology went the other way. Now, in postmodern world, you are seeing a rapprochement, a coming together of science and the occult. You are seeing it in computer video graphics, in particle physics, in holistic medicine, and it's only a matter of time before you see it in biogenetic engineering. We'll clone grandmother's DNA. Grandmother's not dead. We had tea this morning. They will attempt to facilitate reincarnation. It's only a matter of time. Sounds like science fiction? No, it's not fiction. It's just science. Where will the souls of these people come from? Now I realize there are people like Chuck Missler who have gone into all kinds of speculation and things about this. I wouldn't go into the speculations. I'm just talking about what's viably possible as we speak. Mixing the seed. Just as it was in the days of Noah. In some way the Nephilim must return. You will have an incarnation of some kind of demonoids. I once spoke to somebody saved out of black necromancy. 
a big thing in black necromancy, that expression of witchcraft, is sexual copulation with demons. What will happen when they can actually do it physically? And they will. They will not keep their rightful abode. Could this possibly be a way that the Antichrist will counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus when he's assassinated? Conceivably. Conceivably. It's on the horizon. One thing is for sure, the momentum, the pace of these events is overtaking everybody. As Daniel said, knowledge will increase. The total volume of human knowledge doubles every three and a half years. But that's growing exponentially. It's happening quickly. Secondly, they're heading for a calamity. That they won't know the way out. But if somebody comes along and offers them the way out, they will believe it. Germany. It was the cultural capital of Europe. How, how could such educated people, the best engineers in the world at that time, have followed a Hitler? Believe me, if things get bad enough, they'll follow in anybody. They'll follow an Antichrist. Once you reject Christ, you will follow an Antichrist. Once you reject the true and living God, you will follow and find another God. Once you're no longer led of the Holy Spirit, you'll be led by the spirit of error, the spirit of Antichrist. But that's the world! I can't stop! God predicts it, and I can witness the people in the world and show them what the scripture says. I can preach the gospel of the kingdom. That we can do, but we cannot stop it. But that's the world. We're not talking about the world now. We're talking about the church. Let's go back to the hippie movement, the Jesus movement. The bookshelves in every Christian bookshop were filled. With either Christian classics. Books by A.W. Tozer with the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan or books by Francis Schaeffer and the other half of the bookshelves were filled with books about the return of Christ. Some good, some not so good, but everybody was interested in prophecy 40 years ago. Every Christian was interested in prophecy and the return of Jesus 40 years ago. Now we are 40 years closer to it happening and there is much, much less interest now than there was 40 years years ago. That is a deception in itself. Don't have any oil in the lamp. That's what that is what undergirds the philosophy of Saddleback. 
of Mars Hill Church. Bring your Just make sure this will tell you psychology hype and we'll make it seeker friendly we'll even make it hip we'll even make it vulgar the foolish virgins are going no place these things in the Middle East are unfolding as we speak once more, let's go back to 430 B.C. Iran arises as a strategic threat to the West. Greece is in utter crisis. Rome is in turmoil, bringing instability to Europe. 430 B.C. Pick up the newspaper. Unbelievable. No, the world does not see it. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. They cannot see it. They don't understand why they are so desperate to make the iron stick to the clay. But we are supposed to see it. We are supposed to understand it. We are supposed to know how to prepare for it. We are supposed to to be like the early Pentecostals, put the battery in the flashlight, or as the early Pentecostal sang, give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. If there's ever a time to have extra batteries, it's now. If there was ever a time to make sure you've got plenty of oil, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, to understand God's word, it's now. But no. You got to go for the numbers. You got to go for the show. Well, just look at it. Look at the churches that have been built on that model. The first one, the flagship of a church built on marketing and psychology, which they got from Norman Vincent Peale from my native New York, Marble Collegiate Church, a 33rd degree Freemason, the first flagship church built on marketing, seeker friendliness, is the Crystal Cathedral. I used to pray, pray for a slingshot every time I drove by. God had a better idea. <laughs> Fifty-six million in the hole! <laughs> What's left of Heritage USA, Jimmy and Tommy, the third biggest theme park in the world? The first mega church on the East Coast, prime time Christian TV, satellite radio, you name it, they had it. The biggest ministry in the world at that time. What happened to Jim and Tommy? What happened to the airport vineyard church in Toronto, Canada? What happened to Brownsville Assemblies of God after the freak show was over, the financial scandals and the split? What happened to Lakeland, Florida after the tattooed goon abandoned his wife and children and took off with a babe? Go ahead, Mark Driscoll, keep building yeah. on the sand. Go ahead, Mr. Warren, keep building on the sand. But if the Lord does not build a house, it cannot stand. You labor in vain. When the storm comes, and it is coming, your joint is going to cave in quick. Just look at your role model, Mr. Schuler. The show is over. 
What else can you show me? Meantime, pick up the newspaper. The Middle East, obviously. But Europe, no less obviously. I live there. There'll be another fight between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. The conflict with Islam is inevitable. It's going to be like what happened in the 16th century. Now understand this. This is not the first time the existence of Europe was threatened by an impending Islam. It goes back to the principles, as we looked at the other night in the Bible study, of what happened in the book of Judges. When God's own people, Israel, turned away from him, they turned away from his word, he would allow the Philistines or some heathen nation to raise up as his instrument of judgment. Once his own people repented, then he got rid of the Philistines. America, Europe, Israel, these are backslidden nations all under the judgment of God. Islam is God's judgment. It's his instrument of judgment. They're as arrogant as the Philistines, as falsely confident. But you've got unfulfilled prophecies of the wholesale destruction of Arab Muslim capitals like Damascus and Amman that still have to happen. They've not happened before. Europe was threatened in the 16th century. They reached the outskirts of Vienna. The Muslims were going to overrun Europe in the 16th century. But then the Reformation happened. Islam was squashed. You understand what's happening? Unless there is a mighty turning to God, the judgment is going to get worse. Daniel tells us the kings of the north will fight the kings of the south. Islam divides the world into two camps. Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Hab, the world of Islam and the world of the sword. When a politician tells you it's a religion of peace and tolerance, not only are they lying, they know they're lying. They cannot show you a single Islamic country that will give Christians and Jews the rights they get in America or Canada or Britain or Israel or anywhere else. Not even one. They're lying and they know they're lying. When a Muslim says he believes in peace, he's using the word hudna, a temporary ceasefire till we can get the advantage to continue the jihad. Islam has the doctrine of taqwid, permissible lying. They're allowed to lie to you because they don't see it as a lie. They see it as military disinformation in the jihad. No! When Europe comes back, the kings of the north will fight the kings of the south. There will be a conflict between the Western world and Islam. There will be a conflict, as Jack will explain today, with Iran. It is coming. They will do anything and everything to make the iron stick to the clay. They will do anything and everything to combine the seed. But it will not work. The only thing that works is doing what Jesus said. I wish we were listening to him. I wish we were reading the New Testament instead of the shack, instead of the purpose-driven lie. I wish, I wish, I wish. But there is some good news. He told us these things for a reason. The faithful church, the faithful believers who remain loyal to him on the basis of his word will understand. Daniel said, none of the wicked will understand. The fact that these people don't understand is a judgment. But make sure you understand why they are trying to make the iron stick to the clay. You understand 
why they are mixing the seed of men. You understand why the countries that were at the center of world events in Scripture are the same countries at the center of world events again. You understand. It's getting dark and it's going to get darker. Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. You got the flashlight. Don't listen to those foolish virgins. Don't be one of them. You've got the flashlight on your lap. Please, I beseech you by the mercies of God, in the name of Jesus, make sure you have plenty of batteries. We are sure going to need them. God bless. First Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes the following in the resurrection chapter. There are also heavenly bodies in verse 40 and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, but star differs from star in its glory. So also in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown a perishable body, it is raised as an imperishable body. From where is Paul getting this imagery, speaking of the resurrection, by comparing us to stars? Now there's much typology in these things. We have to understand Stars are sometimes figurative of the angelic, but Abraham's descendants will be like the stars of heaven, both his physical descendants, his anthropological ones, and his theological descendants, his descendants by birth and his descendants by second birth. The descendants of Abraham are believers and are Jews, some by birth, some by second birth. They're compared to stars. In the last days, as typologically, when the scripture speaks of the sun and moon not giving their light, you have to understand what these things mean. Yes, there'll be literal astral phenomena before Jesus comes, but the moon has no light of its own. It only reflects the light of the sun. Isaiah tells us when Jesus rises, it's predicted, arise and shine, for your light has come, the glory of the risen Lord is brighter than the sun. All four Gospels tell us that the resurrection of Jesus happened at dawn when it was still dark, but at dawn. Hence, when the moon does not give its light, it will not reflect the light of the sun. The church will no longer reflect the light of Jesus. The light of Jesus will not be seen on the earth at the hour of darkness when Antichrist is running amok. These things have been dead, and we will meet them in the air. Such it is, it speaks of the resurrection. This is the Episunagage. But notice it says, there will be a time of distress such as never occurred before. This is precisely what Jesus said concerning the Great Tribulation. Nothing that bad has ever happened before, nor will anything that bad happen again. Hence we know that Matthew 24, the Great Tribulation, what we read about in the Olivet Discourse, cannot possibly be referring to the events of first century. The events of the first century in 70 AD were only partially fulfilled. Worse things have happened both to the Jews and to the church since 70 AD. Daniel and Jesus make it clear it'll be unique. Nothing this bad will have ever happened and will not happen again. But then we read there will be a rescue. A rescue. How are you going to get rescued if you don't believe there is a rescue? Again, it's only public knowledge. When you have Rick Joyner saying that the rapture is a lie of the devil, when you have Jevil Coates in England teaching the rapture is a fantasy and a myth, when you have Mike Bickle saying the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah, when you have people like Rick Warren saying avoid end time prophecy, when you have Mark Driscoll mocking people who study end time prophecy, how will you get rescued if you don't believe there is a rescue? We always point out the foolish virgins are going no place, and they're going no place fast. There will be a rescue. There will be a time of great distress following a spiritual battle that will take place in the heavenlies with ramifications on earth. 
involving Michael, the great prince, Mikael, he who was like unto God, fighting the principalities. One of the principalities, of course, is the principality of Persia, the demonic powers over Persia, as Jack will undoubtedly be explaining. Nonetheless, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Here's where Paul gets the resurrection language. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Let's begin with those who have insight. When it gets dark, you need a good lamp. It gets very dark before Jesus comes. Remember the language of Scripture. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? Work while you have the light. Night will come. No man can work, Jesus said. He's coming like a thief in the night. Those who want to get drunk, get drunk at night. At night. He's coming like a thief in the night. It's going to get very dark, and we need to be able to see. In the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. You need to be able to see when he's coming. It's going to get dark. Those who have insight. What teaches about those who will have insight? Those who will understand what is happening. Those who will understand prophecy and know what to do about it. Is found in chapter 11. Let's just go back briefly to chapter 11. Verse 32, and by smooth words he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly towards the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. And those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and plunder for many days. When they fall they will be granted a little help and many will join with them in hypocrisy. And some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the time of the end, because it is still to come at the appointed time. Then the king will do as he pleases and will exalt and magnify himself above every god and speak monstrous things against the god of gods and prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. Up until verse 36 we have a partial historical fulfillment by Antiochus Epiphanes. If you don't know what Antiochus or who Antiochus Epiphanes is, it is Daniel's vision of Greece. Antiochus Epiphanes was a Seleucid king, Antiochus IV. He set up an abomination in the temple of the Greek god Zeus, giving the Greek god Zeus his own facial features. Zeus, which the Greeks identified with the planet Jupiter, because it was the largest planet, the largest god. Zeus is a corruption of the Greek word, Zeus is a corruption of Theos, God. Okay. He sets this up in the temple and slaughters a pig. That is a foreshadowing of the abomination of desolations. What happened at that particular time was God raised up people called the Maccabees, a priestly family. Part of the reason the Jews did not understand who Jesus was and accept him as Messiah is they wanted a political Messiah who would come like the Maccabees and get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees had gotten rid of the Greeks 160 years earlier. The temple was rededicated. The Maccabees understood what was happening spiritually and theologically before they launched their guerrilla war against the Seleucids. Now Jesus understood this story and celebrated it. In John chapter 10, you see him celebrating the Feast of the Maccabees. It's called the Feast of Dedication in the New Testament in English. The Hebrew term is Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the Hebrew Feast of Lights and Miracles. It's against this background, the Lord Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And it's against this background, he asks them, 
for which one of these miracles are you stoning me? Nes Gadol Hayapo, a great miracle happened here. Jesus knew this story. The Antichrist will come in the character of Antiochus in part and set up this Shikutsa Meshomem, the abomination of desolation in the temple as we looked at last night and earlier today. But let's look at this further. Only the Maccabees had insight, understanding as to what was happening. The reason Antiochus was able to get as far as he did, he began passing law after law after law, making it more and more difficult to practice the law of God. In the last days, the same thing happens. Law after law after law. Remember, two weeks ago, for the first time in the history of the United States, the present American administration of Barack Obama passed a law saying you not only have to provide birth control or face a federal fine, you must provide birth control in the form of the morning after pill. You must provide abortion. And religious owned organizations are not exempt unless somebody works directly for a church. If you work for a Catholic hospital or an evangelical hospital or an evangelical organization, you are not exempt. You must pro provide, in effect, abortion. Obama said, you must kill the baby or you're going to be prosecuted and fined by the federal government. That is how evil our government has become. And it is going to get worse before Jesus comes. It's going to become increasingly difficult to practice biblical Christianity. Abominations of desolation, remember it was Mr. Bush who took the book, the Koran, that says God has no son, and put it in the White House. It doesn't matter which party. Nations get the leaders they deserve, and it's getting worse. This is going to happen. There will be more and more laws, but the problem the Maccabees faced was this. There were people who collaborated with the Seleucids. There were Hebrews who went along with it and participated with it. That also happens in the last days. The first person the Maccabees assassinated was not a Seleucid. The first person they assassinated at a place called Modein was a Jewish collaborator whose name was Menlaus. There is no shortage of people named Menlaus today. They are evangelical leaders who sanction ecumenical union and the interfaith movement. That's what they are, that's what they do. I would again point you to Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan, among other things. We have to unite with Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists to bring in global peace. This is what's happening. It was shocking. That book, Ecumenical Jihad, we have to have ecumenical union with Islam to morally save America, endorsed by the late Chuck Colson, endorsed by J.I. Packer, the reformed theologian. These are the sons of Menlaus. They collaborate with the enemies of God against their own people. The Maccabees understood this. You keep selling out. You keep giving up, giving up, giving up. Pretty soon, the true worship of the true God will be illegal. They began practicing laws against things like circumcision. Already, there's people in San Francisco that want to outlaw circumcision for Jews. They began passing laws against public reading of Scripture. There are homosexuals who want to make it illegal to read Romans chapter 1 and portions of Deuteronomy that condemn homosexuality. They want to outlaw it as hate literature for public reading. Christians have already been persecuted for reading it. Pastors in Canada and Sweden. They're calling the Word of God hate literature. What happened in the days of the Maccabees happens again. Remember, seven times the church, seven times the church is called the temple of God in the New Testament. Variously using the Greek terms oikos, hegios, naos, heron, seven times. The abomination is already being set up in the temple. You want to see the abomination of desolations? Look at Rick Warren's global peace plan. Unite with the Buddhists, unite with the Muslims, unite with the Hindus to bring in world peace. It's, it's already happening, theologically and spiritually. A Koran in the White House, it's already happening. It's already Ramadan, celebrated at the White House by Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama. It's already happening. But now it's come into the church, even into the evangelical church. 
but those who have insight will understand and give insight to the many. But they will fall by the sword, they will be betrayed from within. Two of the five Maccabees, there was a father and five sons, two of them were betrayed by their colleagues. Many will join with them in hypocrisy. There is people who will align themselves with someone like me, or like Dave Hunt, or something like this, because they're against what we're against. But that doesn't mean because someone's against what you're against that they are for what you are for. Many of these people have their own agenda. As long as you're a sounding board for what they don't like, they're for you. But give it enough time, they'll turn against you. <laughs> you cannot build a church or a ministry based on what you're against, only based on what you are for. They will turn against you eventually. Many will join with them in hypocrisy. The Maccabees found this out the hard way, and it will happen in the last days. There will be those who will give understanding to the many, who will see the seduction of God's people happening the way it took place in the time of the Maccabees, as Daniel predicted. These will have insight, and they will shine brightly like the expanse of heaven. Then there's the second group. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. That's where Paul gets it in 1 Corinthians 15. In the resurrection, star differs from star in its glory. Both Daniel 12, 1 Corinthians 15 speak of the resurrection and use the stars to illustrate those who are resurrected. Those who lead many to righteousness. We are not called to lead people to Christ. We are called to lead people to Christ in order to lead them to Christ-likeness. Jesus never said, never, did he say to make converts. He said to make disciples. Evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. Evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. Jesus told the Pharisees, you go to the ends of the earth to make a convert and become twice as much of son of hell as he used to be. What good is it leading people to Christ and putting them in freak show churches? That's not going to make disciples. I had a friend who was a very successful evangelist who God blessed in New Zealand and the South Pacific. Good friend. But he was one of those people who would align himself with anybody and speak in any church as long as he can, quote unquote, preach the gospel. So I said to him, this is not what Jesus said to do. And he said, I'm only called to preach the gospel and to prepare the church for the last days. I said, well, when Jesus spoke of the last days, he warned about deception four times more than he did anything else. Where did he ever say to make converts? He wouldn't listen. He'd get on any platform with anybody. He was putting people in word faith churches, name it and claim it churches, as long as they let him in. His own daughter went to one of these churches. And her husband died in a scuba diving accident and she went into depression. She had an infectious disease that was dormant since childhood that she acquired in the mission field with her father when she was a little girl acquired in the South Pacific. They eventually diagnosed it here in Los Angeles at the School of Tropical Medicine, but it was too late to eradicate it. It was just dormant. The stress of the bereavement seemed to trigger a relapse, and she kept being told by this church, name it and claim it. Just claim the victory. Claim the healing. And when she didn't get the healing, she was put under condemnation. You lack faith. You lack faith. It's not happening because you don't. It's your fault. She hung herself. Oh. Now do you see, evangelist? Now do you see? Your own daughter is dead. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Those churches can kill people. In Great Britain, Morris Cirillo, the money preacher, came to England. He told the young woman she was healed at the age of 22, a young black woman. 
she drowned in her bath when she ceased taking vital anti-epilepsy medication. The Crown Coroner, Samantha Q. Levine, did the autopsy. After the post-mortem, he appeared on national news, national TV news, and said, this woman would be alive if she didn't go to Morris Cirillo. What a wonderful testimony. These churches can kill people. He never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. With all due respect to Billy Graham, a man who I admired tremendously as a younger believer. I worked in London 89 on the Billy Graham crusade. I will never do it again. I do have a more favorable view of his son Franklin, but in London 89 he had the Roman Catholic Cardinal who was found guilty of protecting pedophile priests on the platform with him. They were putting converts into liberal churches that didn't even believe the gospel. He didn't care. He was just going to preach the gospel, preach Jesus. Where did Jesus say to make converts? Those who lead many to righteousness. It's no wonder 95% of the people putting their hands up and coming forth at these meetings fall away. Some of them were never saved to begin with, and the ones who were, were never saved properly taught doctrine. Now we see the same thing happening here. Burden for souls? Absolutely. I was disgusted, heartbroken, to see Greg Laurie get on a platform with Rick Warren. You hear me? I was disgusted and heartbroken. The man suffered a terrible tragedy in his own life, for which I have nothing but compassion. But let's look at the whole picture. Let's look at the whole story. Why would you align yourself with that for the sake of preaching the gospel? Jesus never said to make converts. As long as you can get the numbers, as long as you can fill the stadium, as long as you can get the message out, where did he ever say to do that? He never did. What about the millions who've been saved through these ministers? Saved into what? A zoo with the cross on the roof? Some of these churches are lunatic asylums. But they compromise. It is those who lead many to righteousness. Like the stars of heaven, they will shine forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. And boy, is that happening in a multitude of ways. Certainly knowledge of the scriptures increasing among the wise virgins. It's decreasing among the foolish ones. But let's look further. Seal up the book. Apocalypse in Greek is apocalypsis. The book of Revelation is like a curtain. It's lifted up progressively. The closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more the curtain goes up. There are people who are locked into eschatological theologies. Some are mid-trib, some are pre-trib, some are post-trib. They're locked into what they were always taught. The fact is, although these doctrinal truths are already in Scripture, there's no new revelation. What there is, is a clearer understanding of Daniel and Revelation before Jesus comes. No, there's no new doctrine, there's no new revelation, but there is an apocalypsis, a clearer understanding. Until the Holy Spirit has pulled the curtain all the way up, I would be very cautious about being dogmatic and definitive about things, unless I really, really knew. It is a fact. I'm only stating a fact. The modern patriarch of the pre-tribulation movement is a man who was a tremendous scholar of Greek, Dr. John Wolvert from Dallas Seminary. In his book on the rapture, he admits, this is what he said, there is no place, there is no passage in scripture, there is no verse that teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Now you can believe it or you can disbelieve it, but it's not in there. We must base doctrine on induction, not deduction, not on opinion. 
Now, I have no problem with people believing that. But they can't find it in the Scripture. If it is, I'd like to see it. All I'm saying is, it's an apocalypsis. These things are going to be progressively revealed before Jesus comes. There are things that would have made no sense a hundred years ago or a generation ago that make sense now. We can go back to the 17th century. The 17th century, and it's amazing, there were evangelical preachers in Great Britain warning that Israel would be born, be born as a nation in the 17th century. They saw this coming. But there are other things that would have made no sense. But they make sense now. It is a progressive revelation and apocalypse. And it speaks of the Antichrist. If you can't see through an obvious false prophet, if you can't see through Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and Joyce Meyer, what's going to happen when real deception comes? If you can't see through the obvious, what's going to happen when real deception comes? If you don't see what's wrong with partaking of the purpose-driven lie, what's going to happen when real deception comes? Those who have insight will understand. None of the wicked will understand. It says the wicked will act wickedly. What does Jesus say in Revelation? Let them be filthy still. Now look, I have no problem with a pastor addressing social realities of the time in which we live. I have no problem with a pastor addressing sexual issues from the pulpit when appropriate. But when you've got the Mark Driscoll thing using vulgar language, vulgarity, let the filthy be filthy still. His exegesis of the Song of Solomon is a joke anyway. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. Pseudo-theologian. They're going to get worse and worse. God gives them over to it. They will not understand. How can the church be so blind? Paul says directly, he says directly, when they say peace and safety, then the end will come. You've got a global peace plan. We have to unite with people who worship other gods. Gods who Moses calls demons, Shadim, who Paul calls demons, Damanoi. We have to unite with demon worshippers to bring in global peace. None of the wicked will understand. Why can't they see what's wrong with the purpose driven? None of the wicked will understand. How many ex-Catholics here? Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin or do you atone in purgatory for your own? You can laugh because you see it. How come these other ones can't? None of the wicked will understand. They just won't get it. They're not supposed to get it. Make sure you get it. Stars that shine forever. Those who have insight, those who understand the prophecies, those who understand the scripture, those who understand what's going on and why and know what to do about it, they will shine forever like stars. Those who lead many to righteousness, not those who make converts, those who make disciples, will shine forever like stars. Stars! We've just had the Olympics. The career of most professional athletes is over, well over, by the age of 30. Golfers can go on a little longer, but they're never going to be what they were in their prime. They're not a star that shines. I think of the pop icons of my own youth. John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, Brian Jones, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison. Very few of them reached middle age. Many died in their 20s. 
and they're still snuffing it in their 20s. It's a death trip. Oh, they're big stars, but the stars don't shine forever. Just look at reality TV and TV commercials. A film star is as successful as their last movie. When you can no longer make it in the box office, you make commercials and go on reality TV and quiz shows. The stars don't shine forever. I remember walking with my daughter in Miami before the house of Johnny Versace, one of the most successful fashion designers in the world. He bought a house from Italy over to Miami Beach, the beachfront, stone by stone. Beautiful house. Gunned down in front of it in his own steps by another homosexual. Doesn't matter what field, could be fashion, could be sports, could be pop music, could be film, those stars don't shine forever. They just don't. No, the only one who can make a star shine forever is the Lord. Whenever I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, Kenya, anywhere like that, I like to look up at night and see the Southern Cross. You can't see it from up here, the same as you cannot see the North Star from down there. And I look at it, it's quite pretty because if you do the geometry right, you can navigate by it. And I just try to think which way my wife is. <laughs> I had a guy who was an amateur astronomer show me how to do the geometry and figure out where England was and wherever I happened to be. And so I like to do that when I'm in the Southern Hemisphere. It was just down there a few weeks ago, looking up. I remember one time I was in Christchurch, New Zealand, before the earthquake, and I came out and was in the car park, the parking lot of a church. And as usual, at night I looked up and I was looking up at the North Star. It looked pretty good and everything. But there was a shooting star, which, of course, astronomers tell us are not really stars. They're asteroids or comets. But I looked up, looked pretty, look at it. Do you see it? It captivates everyone for a fleeting second. It completely dominates the night line for a fleeting moment. Everybody looks at it. Did you see it? <laughs> That's the way it is trusting in this life and this world. Elvis, Marilyn, James Dean. Here today, gone tomorrow. But you know, the shooting star came and went. But the Southern Cross is a cross. That cross is still up there. Those stars shine forever. Hollywood is where people come to be stars. Some go to New York or Las Vegas or London, but Hollywood is really the place where people come to be stars. I once read something. There are thousands of people a month coming into Hollywood with aspirations that will not materialize to anything. Thousands a month sometimes. Stars that do not shine. Forever. It just don't matter. It's over. Not only is the world like that, so are worldly churches. Counterfeit revivals, trends, fads. Toronto, Pensacola, Lakeland. What's the next freak show in town? Now, with the demise of Schuler, the mega churches are beginning to collapse. No, those stars don't shine. The only star that matters is ones that shine forever. But that's something the world cannot make happen.
And it's something worldly churches cannot make happen. But those who have insight, those who lead many to righteousness, they will be stars that shine forever. My dear brethren in Jesus, make no mistake about it, it's true for me and it's true for you, it's true for every one of us. Forget Hollywood. God is out to make you a star. God bless.